Hello, we're going to be starting chapter 27 on normal anatomy of what you can see from intraoral images. And we it's going to be on chapter, uh, I'm sorry, it's going to be on page 312 of your book. Okay, so in the first part, the learning objectives for the, the landmarks of the maxilla uh, will be to define the key terms associated with normal anatomy on intraoral images, to state the difference between cortical and cancellous bone, uh, define and discuss the general terms that describe prominences, spaces, and depressions in bone, be able to, ident uh, to do the following related to normal anatomic landmarks of the maxilla on a human skull. Uh, identify and describe the normal anatomic landmarks of the maxilla on a human skull. Describe uh, and identify the normal anatomic landmarks of the maxilla as viewed on dental images. And identify each normal landmark of the maxilla as either radiolucent or radiopaque as viewed on dental images. Okay, so why are we doing this? We need to be able to go over the uh, normal anatomy of the maxilla and the mandible as viewed on the skull. We have to be able to do this to describe the normal ana uh, an anatomic landmarks seen on our intraoral images. You really need to be able to recognize these anatomic landmarks on our images, the intraoral images, to be able to mount all of our films correctly. And I don't just mean uh, with traditional film, when you're taking digital radiographs, you do have to orient and space out all of the, the dental images that will pop up, but also you need to be able to interpret the images accurately. A lot of the time your dentist is relying on you to, you know, kind of give the heads up. You take the x-rays at the beginning and, you know, maybe they don't come in until all the way at the end. And so if there's something going on with your patient, um, you know, you're not able to diagnose, but you are able to recognize that, you know, something is wrong or you need to be able to recognize that, um, you know, that it's a normal anatomic structure. And in order to understand uh, if something is wrong, first you have to understand what normal looks like. We're going to be talking about each one of these. So the different types of bone, there's both cortical and cancellous bone. We'll talk about prominences, the different, the different uh, names for prominences in bone, uh, the spaces and depressions in bone and the names that those have. And then we'll talk about miscellaneous stuff too. Uh, types of bone. Bone is very, very important to a dental hygienist, by the way, because we are all about making sure that we preserve and protect and maintain our patient's alveolar bone, okay? And the alveolar bone is made up of two different types of bone. These can be broken down further, but we're not going to get into those. So the first one is cortical bone, and it is the very dense outer layer of bone. It is radiopaque, because it is so dense, it does not allow x-rays to pass through it, which means that it shows up white on our x-rays. Cortical bone can sometimes be referred to as compact bone, and it just means that it is very, very dense. Then we have cancellous bone. Cancellous bone is soft and spongy bone that's located between two layers of dense cortical bone. Typically, it will appear radiolucent, which means it's going to appear dark. However, it's going to have something called trabeculae. I always think of Alex Trebek. Uh, trabeculae appear radiopaque. Um, and they are marrow spaces that are that appear radiolucent. So the bone you can see in this image, it has all these spaces here. And all of those spaces allow for marrow and blood vessels uh, and nerves to penetrate this bone and to innervate and, and supply blood vessels and all of that wonderful um, um, sensation and, and, and life to our bone. Um, and in order to do that, it has to have all of these little, the, the little spaces. And so what you get is kind of like a lacy appearance here. You'll have, it'll be dark, but there'll be all these little white sort of interlocking lines. And here is two images that are able to really show that. So here on the left, we have that cortical bone, this very solid plate of bone right at the bottom. Uh, the inferior border of the mandible is often known for having a very uh, def definite line of cortical bone. And then on the right, we have cancellous bone. And you can see all these sort of lacy, 
um, interlocking lines that we have of the white, but for the most part, the bone is soft and it's not as dense, so the x-rays do pass through this area. Not like white space, it's not like as dark as it is up here, obviously, but um, it does allow the, the x-rays to pass through somewhat, except for those little tiny sort of interlocking um, areas. Uh, the spaces, again, those are called trabeculae. All right, so prominences in bone. Prominence are areas that stick out or they stand out from the bone around them. And they have different names depending on the uh, specific characteristics of the area that is sticking out. So a process is a marked prominence or projection. Typically a process is somewhat larger, like the temporal process of the occipital bone. It's a pretty large area that's not, uh, it's not, it's not small and it's, it's not usually sharp or um, uh, like curvy or anything. It's, it's rounded and it's big. Then ridge is a linear prominence in, or projection, and so most of the time you would think of the uh, alveolar ridge, right, where those teeth stick out. They follow a certain line as they curve around the dental arches. There's the external oblique ridge, and there's the mylohyoid ridge. All of these are areas that it follows a line that sticks out. A spine is a sharp thorn-like projection. You can think of this little nasal spine up here, this little tiny sort of, I mean, it looks sharp if you were to, you can like cut yourself on that, uh, that little tiny spine and it's, it's sharp. It's pretty small usually. Um, a tubercle is a small bump or nodule. Usually it's, it's not like perfectly rounded. Sometimes it's irregular, uh, but it's usually pretty small and um, it's not sharp. And then a tuberosity is a rounded prominence. It's usually a little bit bigger than a tubercle. Usually it's much more round and smooth and, um, and not as sort of irregularly shaped as a tubercle would be a tuberosity. You can see how those words are pretty close because they're very similar to one another, um, but a tuberosity is more rounded. And you can think of the maxillary tuberosity, which I know you guys talked about in preclinic because you would have had to do it for EOIO. Um, all of these structures, these prominences of bone, bone, we want to remember, is radiopaque structure. So all of these areas, you're going to notice they are white. They show up white on our x-rays because they're more dense and x-rays do not pass through them. So spaces and depressions in bone. There is the canal, which is a tube-like passageway through bone that contains nerves and blood vessels. You can think of the mandibular canal. It is literally a tube of bone. It's, it's like a, a tube that is not bone inside and surrounded by bone. Then there is a foramen, which is an opening or a hole that permits the passage of nerves and blood vessels. A fossa is a broad, shallow, scooped out area or depressed area. And then a sinus is a hollow space, cavity, or recession. Uh, spaces and depressions in bone do not resist the passage of x-rays and they for, therefore they appear radiolucent. Spaces, canal, foramen, fossa, and sinus, they will all be radiolucent or dark. These I think are funny, miscellaneous. So a septum is a bony wall or partition that divides two spaces or cavities. Uh, think of the nasal septum, right? It divides our nose, our sort of nasal cavity in half. And uh, if you have like a deviated septum, you have a hard time breathing, right? Um, this shows up radiopaque, the little wall, the part that divides our nose or our nasal um, cavity in half, that little wall, that is radiopaque, which means it shows up white because it doesn't let x-rays pass through it. Um, the septum can be present within the space of a fossa or a sinus. That's usually where you'll find a septum. And then a suture is an immovable joint representing a line of union between adjoining bones of the skull. So as you guys are probably learning in head and neck anatomy, there are sutures anytime two bones um, are fused together, there is a suture. And that suture, while the bones are usually uh, very, very well attached to one another, they're not perfectly um, 
you know, meshed, there is always a little tiny area where it's radiolucent. It's more radiolucent than the two bones that are touching one another. And you can see here, this is the, uh, the median palatine uh, suture, and you can see it's the little radiolucent line. You'll see this a lot on x-rays. I see a lot of students who will take this x-ray on a patient, and it's been, you know, a few months since you've had radiology, and you see something like this, and you kind of, you're like, oh my god, something wrong with my patient. Um, that area is, is totally normal. It's just where the suture is. Um, and so a suture is radiolucent but a septum is radiopaque. Both of them are kind of just this little thin line. All right, so the bony landmarks of the maxilla. The upper jaw is composed of two paired bones, the maxillae. Most of the time, once these two maxillae have fused together, they are considered one. They're mostly they're talked about or referred to as like a single bone, the maxilla, but they are not. They're two bones that fuse together. Uh, the paired maxillae meet at the midline of the face. Now, the maxilla is a very, very important bone. It is the area where most of the time all of the nerves we need pass through the maxilla at some point, and all of the bones of your face, not your head, just your face, will touch the maxilla. And um, so not only does the maxilla form the floor of the orbit of the eye, right? So the bottom of the eye touches the maxilla, but it also has the sides and the floor of the nasal cavities. It completely encompasses the nasal cavity. And then it also makes up the hard palate and all of the teeth um, of the, the maxillary teeth are on the bottom of the maxilla. So not only is the maxilla, you know, holding up our eyeballs and containing our nose, but it's also holding our upper teeth in uh, from the bottom as well. So it's, it's a very important bone right in the middle of our face. All right, so being such an important bone in the middle of our face, then it has its own landmarks, and there are quite a few of them. We're going to talk about each one of these, where they are, and what they look like. So we'll talk about the incisive foramen. We'll talk about the superior foramina of the incisive canal. We'll talk about the median palatal suture, which we've talked about a little bit, the lateral fossa, the nasal cavity, the nasal septum, the floor of the nasal cavity, and the anterior nasal spine, which I also kind of talked about a little bit. But wait, there's more. There's the inferior nasal concha, the maxillary sinus, which includes the septa within the maxillary sinus and the nutrient canals within the maxillary sinus. There is an inverted Y. There's a maxillary tuberosity, a hamulus, a zygomatic process of the maxilla, and the zygoma. First up is the incisive foramen. Now remember, a foramen is a hole in bone, okay? So the incisive foramen is a little tiny hole or uh, opening in the bone right there between numbers eight and nine. It's an opening or a hole in bone that's located at the midline of the anterior portion of the hard palate, directly posterior to the maxillary central incisors. In EOIO, each of you remember having to look at and palpate the, um, the nasopalatine or the incisive papilla. That is this. The, the nerves that come through the incisive foramen actually are why that incisive papilla is so darn sensitive because of this little foramen. It looks like a very small or uh, ovoid or round, it's, it's pretty ovoid, uh, radiolucent area located between the roots of the maxillary central incisors. Um, we sometimes will see this on our x-rays, um, not too terribly often. Usually it's not something you get right at the right angle that you get it perfectly like this one is. Um, but if you look at this picture here, or if you're looking in your book, it is on figure 27-14. Next up is the superior foramina of the incisive canal. So a foramen is one, one little opening, one little bony, well, not bony hole. The uh, superior foramina 
well, superior means above. Foramina means more than one hole <laughs> of the incisive canal. So uh, this is two tiny openings or holes in bone that are located on the floor of the nasal cavity. Then, while inside the bone, they actually join together to form the incisive canal, which then exits through the incisive uh, foramen. It looks like two small round radiolucencies located superior to the apices of the maxillary central incisors. So if you see here on your x-ray, those little areas, the, I'm sorry, the little arrows, they are pointing at the, um, the superior foramina of the incisive canal. This is what I was talking about when I said usually you can't see the, um, the incisive foramen, but the incisive foramen is this little sort of dark area right there. This soft, uh, or this line right here along this edge, that's a soft tissue sort of line, and that's the nose <laughs> that we are seeing on our patient. Um, sometimes this is the lip if they have their, their lip pulled up a little bit, but usually on an x-ray like this, it's the nose. Um, anyway, this, these little tiny, um, they're, they're pretty tiny on a person, obviously on this x-ray, because it's enlarged like this, it looks bigger. But those are the superior foramina of the incisive canal. They're gonna join together here, and they're gonna exit out the incisive foramen. All right, like we already talked about, the median palatal suture. This is an immovable joint between two palatine processes of the maxilla. So the two palatal bones, the, the uh, maxillae, they fuse together right in the center, and there's just this little tiny line where that fusion happened. It looks like a radiolucent line between the maxillary central incisors. It almost looks like this area is just cut right in half. Well, because it is. This is one bone, and this is one bone, right? The palatine processes form the major portion of the hard palate, and inside, with soft tissue, we see the uh, median palatal suture by the median palatal um, uh, raffae, right? The uh, median palatal suture, palatine suture extends from the alveolar bone between the maxillary central incisors to the posterior hard palate. Sometimes patients will uh, develop that torus right in the center and they won't be able to feel um, that area as it goes all the way back. But the two hard palates together, uh, the, two, the two maxillae bones, those fuse together and then it goes all the way back to the palatal bones. Um, like I said before, you're going to see this on an x-ray probably a year or two from now. You're going to see this big old line right in the center of someone's face it's when you take their PA. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you stop and think for a second. But I want you to remember that this is a very normal thing. Next up is the lateral fossa. Now remember that a fossa is a depression in bone, right? And a depression shows up radiolucent. So the lateral fossa is also known as the canine fossa, and it's called these two different things because it's found in between the lateral and the canine. If you reach up and touch your own face right in front of your canine, it's sort of right underneath the ala of your nose, you can feel right above your teeth on your alveolar ridge, there's this little depression, and it's your lateral fossa. It is a smooth, depressed area of the maxilla located just inferior and medial to the infraorbital foramen between the canine and the lateral incisors. This is going to make a lot more sense once we talk about where the infraorbital foramen is. But anyway, it is just below the nose um, on the sort of each to each side of your midline uh, between your lateral and your canine. It looks like a radiolucent area between the maxillary canine and the lateral incisors. And so on our x-ray, you can see um, all of those little arrows pointing to that area. It looks like it's a little bit darker than some of the other bone because the bone isn't quite as thick there. If you look in your book, you'll see it on uh, figure Hang on, let me find it. Figure 27-19, it is on page 318. So then the nasal septum, a septum being a little bony wall or partition that divides the nasal cavity into the right and the left nasal fossa. 
Uh, fosse is like more than one fossa. Anyway, um, it's formed by the vomer. I'm sure you guys are learning about that one in head and neck, the vomer bone. It's its own little sort of um, bone that's really small and it um, it sits like right at the center of your nose. Anyway, um, it's formed by the vomer and a port and a portion of the ethmoid bone and cartilage. So the nasal septum is what uh, separates your uh, nasal cavity into two halves. Um, sometimes people have a deviated uh, nasal septum and it just means that the nasal septum isn't in the middle and so those people have a harder time breathing. Um, and so then a, a nasal septum, because it is the wall, the bony wall, it is radiopaque and it is the partition that divides the nasal, ca nasal cavity. Uh, you're gonna find this on figure um, 22 dash, I'm sorry, 27 dash 22. That one right there where it's pointing um, right in the middle of the, the uh, nasal cavity, that is the nasal septum. So then if we have a nasal septum, deviate our, you know, breaking our nasal cavity in half, then we have to have a floor of the nasal cavity. And we see this on our x-rays, excuse me. Uh, the floor is composed of dense cortical bone and it separates um, the, the, the nasal cavity from the alveolar bone, right? It's a bony wall formed by the palatal processes of the maxilla and the horizontal portions of the palatine bones. Um, so where we say it on our x-ray, it looks like it's just in the front, right? But it's not just in the front. It actually does extend further back and above the, uh, the hard palate. Um, and so on our x-rays, the floor of the nasal cavity is a dense radiopaque band of bone right above the maxillary incisors. On an x-ray, it shows it's two-dimensional, but in real life, it is three-dimensional and it extends uh, further sort of deep into the face. All right, the anterior nasal spine. We talked about this when we were looking at the uh, the skull, when you were looking at it from the side. Remember that sort of spiny little projection that stuck out at the bottom of the nose? That's this thing. So it is a sharp projection of the maxilla. It's located at the anterior and inferior portion of the nasal cavity. On an x-ray, it will appear as a V-shaped radiopaque area located at the intersection of the floor of the nasal cavity and at the very bottom of the nasal septum. You can see it really well on this x-ray or this radiograph and you can see how it has that little V-shape and I mean to me it kind of looks like a duck's foot but um or like you know like a chicken foot. Anyway it's like you know like this let toe, this toe, and this toe. Anyway, um, so this part up here is the nasal septum. This part down here, like these areas coming down to the center, this is the floor of the nasal, um, the, the inferior border of the, na the floor of the nasal cavity. And then this little tiny area where these all meet, this little V, that is the anterior nasal spine. And it looks like that, it's more radiopaque than the others because it is, sticks out. And so it's more radiopaque. I'm just gonna take all those off so you can see it. See how this, this little tiny spot right here, this is a little, uh, spine sticking out. It's really sharp. Sticks right out. The uh, inferior nasal concha. I don't know what it is about this word, but it just it just doesn't stick with me. It doesn't look like it's supposed to be pronounced that way. Um, I don't know. I, hygiene school. I was every time I came up uh, on this word, I was like constantly tripping over it. But anyway, it is a wafer thin curved plates of bone. Uh, they they are, there's two of them, uh, that extend from the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. So from the outside going toward the inside, they're like these little swirly sort of doohickeys. Uh, concha actually means shell shape, like a conch shell, and uh, or it can mean like a scroll shape. That's actually how the conch shell got its name. Anyway, the appearance on a, a radiograph is going to be a diffuse radiopaque mass or projection within the nasal cavity. It's this fuzzy, blurry little 
blob right there inside the nasal cavity. You can see it's very different. It's not like bone, right? It doesn't have that sort of lattice or lacy texture to it. It's, it's not like uh, cancellous bone. It is, um, it's just this fuzzy, blurry, sort of foggy looking mass inside the nose. And that is the inferior nasal concha. You can see that on page 320 in figure 27-26. The maxillary sinus. So this one I think is interesting. It's always like a good topic starter for patients when they see their, their maxillary periapical radiographs. But um, because the sinus is it's so unique to every person. Uh, every individual has a different shape uh, to their maxillary sinus. Um, it's one of those things when you guys did uh, in last week where you did the forensic um, PowerPoints and you talked about how, you know, we use these radiographs um, in order to identify people that we wouldn't be able to identify, you know, based off of like soft tissue uh, sort of things. And so um, we use these radiographs. Well, maxillary sinus shape actually is one of those things that many of you put on your PowerPoints um, as a way to identify people through radiographs. So um, I, I think that the sinus is really cool. When you're first born, actually, your maxillary sinus is only about the size of a small pea. And then as you grow, it grows. But also you have to think about those permanent teeth that are sort of lying in wait uh, inside the alveolar bone for the child to grow, exfoliate the primary teeth, and then those permanent teeth are able to grow in. And so once those teeth grow in, they take up less space, obviously, inside the alveolar process. And the... Uh, the sinus is able to fill in that space and take up more room, which is good. It's one of those reasons why, you know, when you see kiddos and you think they're all like snot-nosed kiddos, <laughs> they don't have a lot of room inside their, their sinus cavity for all of that mucus. So it sort of spills out the front of them. Uh, whereas, you know, adults have more room and so they, you know, they just have, they have just as much mucus. It's just, just you know, staying inside their face. Um, Anyway, the maxillary sinus is a paired cavity or compartments of bone. Um, it, they're paired cavities in the bone, which is located within the maxilla. It's located above the maxillary premolar and molar teeth or superior to those maxillary premolars and molars. Uh, they appear as a radiolucent area located above the apices of the maxillary premolars and molars. This radiograph is really nice because it shows you what happens when patients lose teeth. Um, the sinus cavity will actually fall or drop down into that space because those maxillary teeth, uh, the roots of them actually kind of hold up that sinus and prevent that bone from resorbing from the top. And I mean, to a certain extent, it prevents bone from resorbing from the bottom, but you guys will learn about that later. Um, and so the teeth play a really important role here in keeping that sinus up where it's supposed to be. It's okay, there's nothing wrong with this sinus, you know, uh, but when a patient, um, is going to have an extraction, the dentist will require a periapical radiograph of that area in order to see where that sinus is. Because if the apice of the sign of the tooth is kind of up at the, you know, at the very bottom of the sinus, and then they pull that tooth out, there's a, a, a chance, sometimes it's a very good chance, and sometimes, you know, it's not as likely, but when they pull that tooth, they actually sometimes can have a communication between the sinus and the oral cavity because, um, you know, they pull the tooth, and so now there, there's a hole, and it just, it's connected to the sinus. So, um, you know, sometimes you'll have drainage of the sinus into their mouth um, and and it happens and then uh, you know when that happens the dentist usually will uh, put in like a bone graft or something and, and seal that area off to try to reduce that um, sort of of communication um, the floor of the maxillary sinus is composed of dense cortical bone but the actual maxillary sinus itself is a cavity, okay? Uh, what, what we're looking at here with those arrows, that is the floor of the maxillary sinus, okay? 
So septa within the maxillary sinus, um, septa is the plural version of septum. So a septum, which is a bony wall or a partition, right? Like the nasal septum. Septa are more than one. And it, it they are, sorry, not it, they are bony walls or partitions that appear to divide the maxillary sinus into compartments. They look like radiopaque or white lines within the maxillary sinus. The presence and number vary depending on the anatomy of the individual. This is another one of those parts of the maxillary sinus that really give individuality to each person that you see. Um, your book, whoever chose this picture for the book is also probably the person who chooses the, the radiographs for your boards because it's a horrible, horrible picture of septa. It's, it's not at all a good example. So uh, while your book gives you figure 27-29, it's on page 321 at the bottom, um, that is a septa. However, the, the contrast of this image is awful. There, there's almost no shades of gray here. So um, this is, you know, an image that the angulation is is off because, you know, they're trying to get the palatal root. But anyway, whoever chose that image, I, I don't think that they should be choosing images. I pulled in the picture on the bottom here because you're able to see these septa. And you can see it's almost like these little bubbles that the sinus is made of. And um, each little compartment is divided by septa, okay? Try to keep that in mind that the maxillary sinus, while yes, it is considered this one sort of compartment, sometimes it gets divided in by, by these little sort of bubbles um, and, and it's unique to every person. I bet you guys thought we were done with the maxillary sinus, but we're not. <laughs> so there are nutrient canals that are located within the maxillary sinus. Are these nutrient canals actually traveling through the maxillary sinus? Uh, probably not. They're probably traveling either right above or right below. But on a radiograph, which is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object, we can't see that. All we see is two dimensions. It looks like these nutrient canals are actually in the maxillary sinus. And so they are tiny tube-like passageways that travel through bone that contain blood vessels and nerves. Uh, they look like little radiolucent bands, and it's it says bounded, but bordered by two thin radiopaque lines. You can see those little uh, arrows, and you can see that sort of dark little swoop right there in the middle. That is the nutrient canal within that maxillary sinus. It supplies the maxillary teeth and the interdental areas with blood and uh, sensation. Um, and just keep in mind that the, the radiopaque lines represent the cortical bone that uh, that make up the walls of that canal, okay? But the actual canal itself is, you know, a pocket. It's not made of bone. It's the, the borders are made of bone, but the inside is um, just blood and tissue. And so uh, the inside of it is radiolucent. The inverted Y. Um, in my opinion, this is the most forgettable anatomic structure. It is, it's just one of those things that's like, um, it's, it's, it seems easy and it seems, it seems too simple. And then later you just forget it exists. I, I don't know why it's, it's just, it's so hard to remember, but this is a classic board question. Uh, you're probably going to see it there. And it's also uh, a classically missed board question. Uh, students, dental hygiene, I'm sure dentists themselves, uh, it is a uh, very forgettable structure. Uh, so don't forget about this one. Um, so the inverted Y is the intersection of the maxillary sinus and the nasal cavity. It's where those two meet. The, uh, it, it appears as a radiopaque upside down Y formed by the intersection of the lateral wall of the nasal fossa and the anterior border of the maxillary sinus. It is where these two meet. So the, uh, the nasal cavity is over here and then this is the maxillary uh, sinus and here right in between where I, where you know, the where, actually where the little arrows show you, um, that is the inverted Y. It just looks like an upside down white Y. 
It's always located above the maxillary canine. Sometimes it's a little bit anterior to right above it, but if uh, if you're seeing the Y on any structure where or any radiograph that you can't also see the canine, you're wrong. It's 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 always on the same radiograph you can always see a canine on. Uh, it is made of dense cortical bone, right? Because we know the floor of the sinus is made of cortical bone and the floor of the nasal cavity is made of cortical bone. So obviously the, the two together uh, form a structure made of cortical bone. Anyway, um, you can see this in your book on figure 27-31 and it is on page 322. The maxillary tuberosity, this should feel very familiar to you since I know you all got points on this one for your for your EOIO exams. And um, it it is a soft tissue structure when you see it with the tissue on there, but it's also a max the maxillary tuberosity is the same area when you see it in bone. It is just the back of the alveolar process there. So it's um, the description is a rounded prominence of bone that extends posterior to the third molar region. Uh, it looks like a radiopaque bulge. I find the word, word bulge funny. Uh, distal to the third molar region. It's just this rounded little curvy edge to the back of the alveolar ridge. And um, it's it's yeah, it's there. It's you can see it. You can touch it. Um, and it always shows up on our x-rays. Um, it's both the bone is the maxillary tuberosity and the soft tissue area, maxillary tuberosity. The hamulus. So this is easy if you are, um, if they just there's just one little arrow, it's easy sometimes to confuse the maxillary tuberosity with the hamulus, but don't. Okay, so the hamulus is a small hook-like projection of bone extending from the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. I just, I just like the way that sounds, the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. You can see a fantastic example of why we see this structure on our radiographs uh, when we look at page 323 in figure 27-33, you can see what that looks like, the sphenoid bone behind the palatal bones, and it is that uh, medial pterygoid plate. It's just this little tiny projection coming down off of that medial pterygoid plate. Um, and so when we place our sensor in there, and we place the sensor, uh, for the most part, it's, it's fairly close to the midline of the palate. And uh, so this structure shows up on our radiographs. It's not very dense, but it is, it's made of bone. So it does show up as a radiopaque hook-like projection posterior to the maxillary tuberosity area. Be careful whenever you see this one or the maxillary tuberosity, make sure you're sure which structure the area is pointing at, okay? Um, I always think of Hamulus uh, as like Hamlet, and he's back there like holding up the, the skull and like the to be or not to be sort of Shakespeare thing back there happening. Um, it's, so the hamulus is also called the hamular process. Um, and yeah, it's on, uh, it's in your book on page uh, 323, which I already said, but this radiograph itself is figure 27-34. One of these days I'm gonna like learn how to do like sweet editing skills and I'm gonna be able to like overlay things and, and I don't know, do cool stuff with these. I, I always like imagine like, oh yeah, I'm gonna find this picture and I'm gonna put it in the slideshow and then it's gonna, you know, make it, it's all, it's all gonna make sense. And then I try to put the picture in there and it looks terrible. So I, I just go, you know, what's, what, what's, what's necessary. But anyway, moving on. The zygomatic process of the maxilla. Um, this is a bony projection of the maxilla that articulates with the zygoma or the malar bone, right? Those, that is the cheekbone. The appearance on a radiograph is a J or a U-shaped radiopacity, which means it's white, located superior to the maxillary first molar region. Um, the zygomatic process of the maxilla is composed of dense, excuse me, dense cortical bone. Okay, try to remember that the zygomatic process of the maxilla is just the part of the maxilla 
that reaches out to touch the zygomatic bone. Okay, so even though it starts out zygomatic process, it's it's not on the zygoma. It is on the maxilla. Okay, so don't get those confused. Make sure you get those nice and separated. The maxillary uh, the the maxillary has a process that sticks out for the zygoma to attach to. Okay. And then, of course, there is the zygoma, which is the cheekbone. It is also called the, the malar bone, or it's also called a zygomatic bone. I don't know. I, I like zygomatic. I like zoma. I like anything that starts with a Z, I think. Like it's, I, I just think it's fancy. So uh, it articulates with the, the zygomatic process of the maxilla, and it is a diffuse radiopaque band extending posteriorly from the zygomatic process of the maxilla. So on this image, this part right here, this is the zygomatic process of the maxilla. And then this structure extending back, that is the cheekbone. That is the zygoma, okay? Don't get this guy mixed up with this guy, okay? Keep those two separate. So the zygoma is the cheekbone. The zygomatic process is the maxilla. This is on uh, page 323 and, no, I'm sorry, it's on page 324 and it's figure 27-37 and 27-38. All right, we're on to the mandibular uh, anatomic structures. So the learning objectives for uh, normal anatomic landmarks of the mandible and tooth anatomy will be to be able to identify and describe the normal anatomic landmarks of the mandible on a human skull, to identify and describe the normal anatomic landmarks of the maxilla as viewed on dental images. That's that's just a part of the other because it's technically all one chapter. And then uh, identify each normal landmark of the mandible as either radiolucent or radiopaque as viewed on dental images. Identify and describe the appearance of normal tooth anatomy and supporting structures as viewed on dental images. Identify each normal tooth structure as radiolucent or radiopaque as viewed on dental images. Um, and identify the primary teeth and eruption patterns of the permanent teeth as viewed on dental images. Most importantly is the mandible, right, of the mandibular structures, of course. The, it is the largest and strongest bone of the face, and it's divided into three main parts. First, there is the ramus, which is the vertical portion found on the posterior aspect to the third molar. Um, so everything from the third molar back is considered the ramus. There's, you know, the coronoid and the, the uh, anyway, the body is the horizontal U-shaped portion from ramus to ramus, um, and then the alveolar process of the mandible, which encases and supports the teeth. You can see the picture here is the ramus and the body, and then if you look in your book on page 325, you'll see the highlighted in red portion that is the alveolar process. I forgot to say on that last slide that, uh, that the mandible is the only movable uh, bone of the human face. Okay, so keep in mind that all of the other bones are, uh, they stay still. We can't move those bones except for our mandible. The bony landmarks that we're going to be talking about of the mandible will include the genial tubercles, the lingual foramen, nutrient canals, the mental ridge, the mental fossa, and the mental foramen. We're going to talk about where each of these are and what they look like on radiographs. We'll also talk about the mandibular canal, the mylohyoid ridge, the external oblique ridge, the anterior border of the ramus, the submandibular fossa, and the coronoid process. The genial tubercles. So this is not something we see very often on a radiograph, only on mostly that, uh, that center mandibular uh, PA, will we be actually be able to see it, the one we're looking at here. And um, it's just such a happy word, like genial actually means like happy or cheerful. And then uh, tubercles in my mind is like tubular. So it's it's such a, I don't know, like a surfer happy word whenever I think about it. Um, 
and they are, what the genial tubercles are, are their tiny little bumps of bone on the lingual aspect of the mandible. They are the attachment sites for the genioglossius and the geniohyoid muscles. This is the area where those muscles attach, and it is these, it's, it's almost like this little bumpy sort of area around that little dot right in the center. That dot in the center, excuse me, is the lingual foramen, okay? So not the dot, that's not what we're talking about when we say genial tubercles. We're talking about that whitish mass right around the dark dot. The dot is the lingual foramen, but the white mass around it are, is the genial tubercle. And uh, it's plural, because I guess there's, it's it's kind of like um, like a like a bunt cake, you know what I mean? Like how it's got the hole in the middle, but then it's like, rounded all around it. Anyway, that's that's what it looks like. Uh, it looks like a ring-shaped radiopacity below the apices of the mandibular incisors, and it surrounds the lingual foramen. You can see this in your book on figure 27-43 and 27-44. So if you look the 27-43, that's what the bone looks like. Um, and it's on page 325. And then if you turn the page, you can see that radiograph um, of this image um, there. And then also in figure 27-45, that's where it shows you what the lingual foramen looks like. And you can see the sort of bunt cake worth of bone <laughs> around the edges of it. So the lingual foramen is a tiny opening or hole in bone located on the internal surface of the mandible. The appearance here is a small radiolucent dot inferior to the apices of the mandibular incisors. The lingual foramen is located near the midline and is surrounded by the genial tubercles, which appear as a radiopaque ring. Okay, we can see this on uh, figures 27-45 and 27 46. Um, this this dot here that you see on on the image, this is an arrow. This is an arrow. That's not that's not the little dot you see on this uh, slideshow. Um, that's just a terrible pixelated picture here. That's the arrow. This dot right here. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw on it and then I'm gonna take it away. That that dot right there. That is the lingual foramen. Okay, and we know it's a lingual foramen because it's surrounded by all of this really pretty, happy, tubular bone, the genial tubercles, okay? That, don't get confused with that little dot on my image here. Then we have the nutrient canals. So just like the nutrient canals would travel through the maxillary sinus in order to get to the apices of the maxillary teeth, we now have nutrient canals that travel through the uh, alveolar process of our mandible in order to get to the mandibular teeth. They are tube-like passageways through bone containing nerves and blood vessels that supply the teeth. Most often they're seen in the anterior because the anterior portion of the mandible is somewhat less dense. It's not as thick. So um, it, it, they show up a little bit better. We don't see them as, as well on the, uh, in the posterior sections just because the bone is a bit thicker for those wider molars. Um, they look like radiolucent lines, which means they're dark lines, uh, readily seen in areas of thin bone. So you can see here that nutrient canal that the image here is pointing to probably went to the central incisor that is no longer there. Um, if, I, if I were to guess, that's what I think happened is that that tooth was pulled and now that nutrient canal is no longer supplying any tooth with anything. It's the, you know, that that one doesn't supply all of the teeth. It's just that's just the one, and each tooth gets their own usually. Um, so you can see this image on page 326, and it's figure 27-47. The mental ridge. So it is a linear prominence of cortical bone that is located on the external surface of the anterior portion of the mandible. That means it's on the outside of the mandible and it's only in the anterior portion. Typically it starts near the premolar section and it goes up toward the chin. Um, it is a thick radiopaque band 
that extends from the premolar region to the incisor region. Often it gets superimposed over the mandibular anterior teeth when we take a radiograph like this where we have such a sharp angle we can see it. Um, your book has the best picture that you can even find uh, of what this is, but it's on page 327. It's figure 27-48, and it's basically the chin. Uh, it's the bony part of the chin that sticks out, so it's thicker, right, than the other aspect of the mandible that we look at. And so because it sticks out, it's it's more dense, and so it shows up more white. Um, but it starts sort of near the premolar, and it comes all the way around the front. The mental ridge is that line that we see on the radiograph. But the section of uh, that part of your, your face, that, you know, your ch the bony part of your chin, is actually sometimes it's called um, the the mental process or the mental prominence or uh, the part in the middle where your two the the two mental ridges touch one another where it meets right in the center um, that's sometimes called the uh, the mental tubercle so anytime you're seeing the word mental we're talking about the chin okay and so um, the mental ridge is on on a radiograph is that white line of the chin as the as the man the premolars come forward toward those the chin premolars to chin is the mental ridge um, but if you see another aspect of it saying you know mental process or mental prominence um, it, it, they're talking about the same exact thing um, it's radiopaque obviously because it's a dense cortical bone and then um, on a radiograph, because of the angle that we have to take it at, typically we'll see where the midline actually slopes up just a little bit, but that is because of the angle. Um, and so if we, you know, how like if you, you know, you get the chin tipped down or you get the chin tipped up on a, on a panoramic, it looks really funny. Well, that's what happens here. Because we have such a sharp angle in order to get the, the bottom, the inferior border on this radiograph, um, that's why the, the, mental, the mental ridge slopes up just a little bit right at the midline. Okay, so the mental fossa, fossa being any area like a depression, right, in bone, and then mental being chin, right? So we're looking for the chin depression. And it's a scooped out depressed area of bone located on the external, so on the front of the face, of the anterior mandible. It is right above the mental ridge. And so if you see the mental ridge, the dark area right above it, that's the mental fossa, and that's what the circle is showing you. The bottom, how it's very, very white, although the, the contrast on this on this radiograph is terrible. Um, the bottom is the mental ridge because it's very, you know, it's very radiopaque. But then the mental fossa is that dark section right above it. Don't confuse this with an infection or uh, any type of abnormality, right? This is very normal. Um, if you look in your book on 27-48, you'll also see how the the mental ridge is really nicely shown but also the mental fossa as the the top of the chin kind of dips in toward the face um, and then extends up for those teeth so the mental fossa is located above the mental ridge in the mandibular incisor region the radiographic appearance of the mental fossa varies um, sometimes it's you know darker sometimes it's lighter depending on the thickness of the bone in that anterior region per person so everybody's just a little bit different um, in order to see this radiograph you'll have to look at figure 27-50 all right the mental foramen so again mental meaning chin right um, this is an opening or a hole because that's what a foramen is. Uh, it's a hole in the bone that's located on the external surface of the mandible, which means it's on the outside of the teeth, right? Uh, in the region of the mandibular premolars. It is a small ovoid or round radiolucent area located in the apical region of the mandibular premolars. It is very commonly thought to be a periapical lesion. Okay, this is where your buccal object rule really comes in handy, okay? Because in your premolar, if you're able to see this, uh, this 
mental foramen, so this radiolucency, um, you see it, and then you're not sure. Maybe the patient's having pain in that area. Maybe you know, maybe they really do have an abscess in this area. Then you would move the tube head. You would take a second radiograph at a different angle. Most likely, you'd go posterior, right? Um, and so, if you move your tube head distal, then you'll see that this um, this uh, radiolucency would actually move the opposite direction, right? Because if it's on the same, if it moves the same direction, it would be on the lingual. If it moves it the opposite direction, then it's on the buckle. Anyway, um, so this tiny foramen is actually very important when it comes to giving local anesthetic. This is an area where we specifically give uh, an injection. And so it's, it's a very important one because if we can put um, local anesthetic right there in that foramen, then we can actually innervate all of the anterior teeth and we can um, we can you know numb those areas and so it it supplies the blood and nerve to the lower lip and it to those lower teeth it's very common uh, it's gonna happen you're gonna see a patient you're gonna see the the mental foramen and you're gonna have that moment where you have that little like something's going on there but I promise you it's a very normal structure the mandibular canal. So if any of you have worked for an oral surgeon, you are very familiar with this mandibular canal, okay? Um, so this is, as a canal, it is you know a tube-like passageway traveling through bone, right? Um, it is where blood vessels and nerves travel through the alveolar uh, area for the mandible, then the mandibular canal, obviously. It houses the inferior alveolar nerve and blood vessels. That's important because, uh, you know, next term you're going to be thinking about the inferior alveolar injection. And so uh, you need to know where the mandibular canal is in order to be able to, uh, to know where that injection is going to go. And so, um, when you give the inferior alveolar injection, you actually come up and you place the needle so that it comes all the way to here, and you'll actually place the anesthetic right here above where this nerve enters into the mandibular canal. There's a little foramen right here. It enters into the, the alveolar process through there. And so uh, the, there's actually a lingual nerve uh, canal that comes through along the front um, on the outside, I'm sorry, not on the outside, on the lingual side uh, for the lingual, um, the lingual nerve. And uh, so on a radiograph, this mandibular canal is a radiolucent band, and it has two little thin radiopaque lines that represent the cortical walls of the canal. Um, and this is where all of the blood and the nerve pass through in order to innervate these teeth. If you've worked in an oral surgeon's office, you know that when you pull mandibular teeth, uh, especially molars, you run the risk of damaging this canal. And if you, uh, you know, if the teeth or the, the roots of the teeth are kind of wrapped around this nerve canal and then you yank the tooth out, um, then you could damage the canal and actually uh, give the patient uh, peristalsis or you know they lose feeling in their um, that section of their of their face so you know if it's on the right or the left you know then they would lose that half of, of uh, sensation so it's really important for oral surgeons to be careful when they're dealing with the mandibular canal so that they don't they don't mess stuff up um, but so the the mandibular canal you can actually see it from the uh, from the mandibular foramen up here this where it enters into the mandibular canal and it actually stops way up here at the mental foramen so this entire section on a radiograph is the mandibular canal All right the mylohyoid ridge is in my opinion the second easiest to forget structure uh, it's just not it's just not a very interesting structure uh, but it, it's you know good show up on your boards certainly you're, you're gonna see these words again um, so it is a linear prominence of bone located on the internal surface of the mandible if you think of your hyoid right the hyoid bone being you know below and and on the inside of the internal surface of where your jaw is then you can kind of think of the Milo hyoid ridge being on the inside and kind of along the bottom of your mandible as well so the red section on this image here um, is is beautiful at showing you exactly where that mylohyoid ridge 
is. It extends from the molar region, as you can see here, forward and downward toward the lower border of the mandibular symphysis. So you can actually feel this in your own mouth if you kind of use the tip of your tongue toward you know, one side, start at the, the mandibular molar, your last molar, and go all the way down, you can kind of set your tongue just underneath that ridge, and then you can follow it forward. If you have a, a lot of mandibular tori, then you might not be able to feel exactly where it ends. Usually it ends somewhere around the premolar section, although everyone is a little bit different. Um, you, and it's not this like sudden stop. It sort of just starts to blend in a little bit better. Um, but you can certainly feel your tongue uh, and kind of catch your tongue underneath it um, over by where your molars are. So try that out. Um, the appearance of this on a radiograph is going to be a dense radiopaque band that extends downward and forward from the molar region. You can see in this image, sometimes it does um, sort of superimpose over where those molar roots are, and that's normal. Um, sometimes it can look exactly with, uh, like right along with the internal oblique ridge, which we'll talk about, um, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the same. Um, and in your book, you can see these on figure 27-55 and 27-56. Okay, so the external oblique ridge. This one is a linear prominence of bone located on the external surface of the mandible, or the body of the mandible. Um, uh, this just makes sense. The external oblique ridge is found on the external surface of the body of the mandible, right? I, I, I feel like that just, it does just go together. So on a radiograph, it is a radiopaque band extending downward and forward from the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. So you always see it um, right there behind where the uh, the, the pterygo, uh mandibular fold is, right? You can see the pterygomandibular fold from your EOIO class, this little fold of tissue right here this little guy. Um, and so you see this external oblique ridge right right here. It is dense cortical bone, so it shows up radiopaque. Okay. Typically, it ends in the mandibular third molar region. You're not going to see it kind of continue all the way down. That's not, that's not what it does. Um, so usually, it, it starts uh, at the very back of wherever you see um, of on a on a bite wing or a PA, um, but on a pano, you know, you'll see the the whole part of the ramus, the coronoid process, um, and so it starts at the anterior border of the ramus and it ends typically around the mandibular third. Uh, sometimes it's also called the external oblique line. You'll see it in your book on figures twenty seven fifty seven and twenty seven fifty eight. All right, so the anterior border of the ramus. Um, the anterior border of the ramus extends vertically and downward from the coronoid process to the external oblique ridge. And on a molar bite wing, the descending ramus of the mandible may be seen as a slightly radiopaque vertical band posterior to the mandibular and uh, maxillary molars. You can see this image on figure 27-59, um, and you can see all of those little white arrows showing you exactly where the anterior border of the ramus is. Um, on that last image, we were able, because of the contrast and the density, we were able to see a lot more shades of gray, so we could see a little bit more of the soft tissue. Um, if you make your radiograph um, have a lot of or very low contrast you get all of those shades of gray you're able to see some of those soft tissue structures but when you have a um a lower contrast and therefore your, your image is a little bit darker here then um well not the whole image you know what i mean um you can see the anterior border of the ramus right there so the submandibular fossa it is a scooped out depressed area of bone located on the internal surface of the mandible, inferior to the mylohyoid ridge, right? So if you're able to take your tongue and, you know, go just below where your molars are, the, the ridge of bone is the mylohyoid ridge. But just below that, that area, that scooped out area right below it, which is what a fossa is, then you can feel that space. That is the submandibular 
fossa. On a radiograph, it shows up as the radiolucent area in the molar region right below the mylohyoid ridge. So on your radiograph, this line is a mylohyoid ridge. This area down here, which is much darker, obviously, is the submandibular fossa. Sometimes it's also known as the mandibular fossa or the submaxillary fossa, which I don't know, that seems ridiculous. Um, it is slightly more radiolucent typically than the adjacent bone in, in, in most of your PAs because it is slightly less dense, right? So up here, the bone is nice and thick, and then down here, it's not quite as thick. And then um, the submandibular fossa is where the submandibular salivary gland is actually located. So it's really important, this submandibular fossa, that it, it's here so that there is room for your submandibular salivary gland, which is, of course, one of the glands that you uh, feel when you do your EOIO. You see this uh, radiograph in your book on figure 27-60. So the coronoid process is a part of the ramus, right? It is the marked prominence of bone on the anterior of the ramus, uh, or the anterior ramus of the mandible. Uh, so we know a process is a part of bone that sticks out, right? It's a prominence. Um, it serves as a site of attachment for one of the muscles of mastication. So it's a very important process up here. And it, Typically on a radiograph, it looks like a triangular radiopacity that is superimposed over or inferior to the maxillary tuberosity. This happens when your patient is open, right? So when you open, you actually, uh, your jaw works as a hinge and glide, right? So it opens on a hinge and then as you open, like, uh, you continue to open, the jaw actually glides forward. And so when it, the patient is open like that, then the coronoid process glides forward and you can see it really nicely on this type of radiograph. If you have your patient biting all the way down, then the coronoid process is usually further back. Um, we don't see this a lot on radiographs because we have our patients bite, but every once in a while, you know, if your patient has a hard time biting or um, the, the PA is just, you know, very large inside their mouth and then they're open a little bit and that means their coronoid process has, um, has glided forward a little bit and you can see it. Ah, we made it to tooth structure. Yes. So we are, we're, we're almost there guys. So the tooth structure here, the enamel obviously is the part that we all we all know what the enamel looks like. It is the outermost radiopaque layer of the crown of the tooth, right? So we don't see any enamel around the roots. We just see it around the crowns of the teeth. Then the dentin comprises most of the tooth structure and it is not as radiopaque as the enamel. So when we are taking a quiz, dentin is a radiopaque structure, right? Because it's it's dense, but it's not as radiopaque as enamel. And then there is the dentino-enamel junction, or the DEJ, excuse me, which is the junction between dentin and enamel. It's the little line where the enamel and the dentin touch. And then there is the pulp cavity, the pulp chamber and pulp canals, right? That is where uh, a dentist would clean out the pulp and place a uh, gutta percha when they do a root canal procedure, right? Um, that is the most radio uh, lucent area of the tooth that inside because it's just nerve and blood vessel and, uh, and tissue. So two structures can be viewed on dental images, obviously, and they are the enamel, the dentin, the dentino enamel junction, and the pulp cavity. You see these on figure 27-63 and 27-63. 65. So the supporting structures of the alveolar bone, right, that hold the teeth in, that's a part of what we see on our radiographs, and it's very important to us as dental hygienists. So the enamel, the, I'm sorry, the anatomy of the alveolar bone is include the, uh, it's going to include the lamina dura, the alveolar crest, and the periodontal ligament space. Um, the shape and density of alveolar bone is going to vary from the anterior regions to the posterior regions, and we're gonna talk about that too. 
um, the alveolar process or alveolar bone serves as the supporting structure for the teeth. So again, very important for dental hygienists. The alveolar bone is composed of dense cortical bone and cancellous bone, right? We see both. And you can see these images on figure 27-66 and 27-67. All right, so this image here is the, um, it's figure 27-69, and it, all of these little arrows, they're pointing to the alveolar crest. But anyway, the anatomic landmarks of the alveolar process include the lamina dura, the alveolar crest, and the periodontal ligament space. The lamina dura is the wall of the tooth socket and it's made of dense cortical bone. Okay, so if you imagine the alveolar process and it has all of these sort of like little pockets or sockets where the teeth fit in, the outer edge, the part that's like gonna attach to the tooth where the tooth socket sits or where the tooth sits in the socket, that is made of dense cortical bone, right? And it appears on our radiograph as a dense radiopaque line that surrounds the root of the tooth. And you can see on this image, because the contrast is so sharp, you, that is why you're able to see the lamina dura so well, is because of how sharp that contrast is. And so you see this sort of white line that, that surrounds the root of the tooth. That is a good thing. That is that dense cortical bone that uh, we want to see on our radiographs. You see this image here on figure 27-68. That's on page 331. The alveolar crest. This is the area where, as a dental hygienist, you spend the most amount of time looking at. Okay, the alveolar crest is the most coronal portion of the alveolar bone found in between the teeth. It's this little section right here in between the teeth. So in your bite wings, when I say it's important to catch the crestal bone, I'm talking about this, this little section, there's this little black triangle right under, right where the teeth meet, right? This bone right here, that is what I'm looking at. And it is made of dense cortical bone and it is continuous with the lamina dura. So the lamina dura is this white line that travels down here. Well, it comes up, comes right across, and then it comes down as well. It's always gonna be radiopaque. And typically it's one to, uh, 1 1.5 to two millimeters, I always say one to two, below the cementin, uh, cemento enamel junction. So the area, when I when I talk to my patients, um, I kind of explain all of this in layman's terms. So here here is my spiel when I say when I talk to patients, I say the main focus for what we're looking at as dental hygienists is this little black triangle right here in between the teeth. The main area what the main things we're looking for are little sort of uh, spicules or spurs uh, that hang off of the tooth that indicate you have a lot of um, uh, plaque or calculus or tartar build up on your teeth and the other area is this bone level and where it sits in relation to where the enamel ends on the tooth and then I always point I show them exactly where the enamel ends and I say it's supposed to be one to two millimeters below where the enamel ends and it needs to be very white if when you look at this radiograph you see that it's kind of fuzzy and dark then that means that they've lost some of that crestal bone and that's very important because that because it's a three-dimensional object and we're looking at it on a two-dimensional screen right if it's all fuzzy right here then that means that at some point either on the lingual or the buccal the patient has lost some of that crestal bone and that is periodontal disease, losing bone, that's periodontal disease. So when I look at my radiographs, if I have nice white, perfect little, you know, crests in between all of the teeth, then I'm happy. If I see fuzzy areas or I see, you know, little sections where the bone is, uh, is you know, way down here, then that means the patient has lost bone and I need to talk to them and I need to, you know, get them to understand periodontal disease and all of those implications, okay? But um, 
as far as radiographs go, we're looking for this. We're looking for the continuation of the lamina dura all the way up as a crest, and then it comes back down, okay? Um, this is differently shaped, right? You can see on this top image, this is posterior and then anterior. This one on top has kind of flat crests, right? It's not like a perfect little archway in between the teeth. It kind of comes up, it's flat, and then it goes back down, sort of like boxy shaped, right? But in the anterior down here, it's, it's much more pointed, right? That's important because obviously there's a lot less space in between these teeth than there is in the posterior area. So keep that in mind when you're looking at crestal bone. But uh, on a bite wing, it, if, if it's a good bite wing, I can see the crestal bone of both the maxillary and the mandibular teeth all in one image. Now, if they've lost a lot of bone and their bone is way down here or way up here, then I need to take vertical bite wings, right? So I can catch that crestal bone on both sides. And it takes significant bone loss to be able to, to not be able to see that on a horizontal bite wing. So um, yeah, if they've lost a lot of bone, you have to take vertical bite wings. Uh, you can see this image um, well, both of these, the top one is figure 27-69, and then the bottom image there for the anterior is 27-71. All right, so there is a periodontal ligament space, and it is the space between the root of the tooth and the lamina dura. It's a very important space, okay? It's important that this space maintains its integrity, right? Um, we don't want to see the space get bigger, but we don't want to see the space get smaller either, okay? We need the space. The periodontal ligaments are little fibers that reach out from uh, the tooth, the cementum of the tooth. The little fiber reaches out and it touches uh, the, the socket, right? That is how teeth are held into the, the mouth with these little fibers. And um, it's, it's connective fiber tissue, there's blood vessels, there's lymphatics there. Um, if patients get calculus down in there, it actually turns black because of the, um, the gravecular fluid, I'm sorry, crevecular fluid. Um, but it's, it's a very important space and it is a very thin, I'm talking very thin, radiolucent line around the root of a tooth. The best one that I can see here is actually this one right here, this little space, you can see this dark line all the way from the crestal bone all the way down. That little dark line, that is the periodontal ligament space. Uh, I don't know who put this picture on bottom here, but this is a terrible picture. It's terrible. But you can kind of see this little black line all the way around this tooth. You can't really see this one. Well, maybe this one right here. Anyway, uh, this picture at the top, the best image of this is, is uh, this, um, little dark line around the tooth socket. That is the periodontal ligament space. All right, and we talked about the difference and the, the shape and the density here. So in the anterior region, the normal alveolar crest appears kind of pointed and it's sharp in between the teeth. And the alveolar crest appears as a dense radiopaque line in the anterior region. The alveolar crest fibers run from the crest of the alveolar bone to the cementum in the region of the CEJ. What does that mean? It means that from the, the dentino, I'm sorry, the CEJ, which is the cementum, uh, cemento enamel junction, sorry, it, that where you know it goes from enamel to cementum covering the dentin. So this cementum is connected to, by little fibers, to the lamina dura. Okay, so in the posterior regions, the normal alveolar crest appears kind of flat and smooth in between the teeth, right? The alveolar crest appears less dense and less radiopaque than the alveolar crest we see in the anterior region, and that's okay as long as it doesn't lose that sort of lighter appearance from the cancellous bone. We wanna see that cortical bone at the crest. Um, but it's okay if it's not like this perfect sort of arch look, okay? In the posterior, it's a little bit more flat and that's normal because of the shape of the teeth, right? Um, man, I get a little squirrely when these, uh, when these lectures last more than an hour. It, it just feels a little long. This is probably one of the most important chapters, um, it, it, you know, right next to the chapter 29. Um, 
for your boards and for you know passing uh, all of the stuff but but I, I know it's such such important material but after a while you know you get kind of drained um so if you need to pause and then come back later when you feel fresh you do that okay we're getting close to the end though so this is good so uh the primary and mixed dentitions um were, are what we're going to be talking about next primary teeth typically begin to erupt at around six months old um we all know from our last few chapters uh, from the eruption pattern that you know the two uh, mandibular central incisors will always erupt first and whatever uh, eruption pattern they had those are usually the pattern it takes to fall out around the age of three um, it's usually like two or three all 20 primary teeth are erupted and functioning and so on kiddos when you're taking radiographs by three all of their primary teeth should be there um, as far as for radio for for the radiographer you need to be confident in being able to recognize normal anatomy in children and to know okay these teeth should be present and these teeth should be either exfoliated or unerupted um, you want to be fairly familiar or or you know you you need to be pretty familiar with um, which teeth should be present and which ones shouldn't okay so primary dentition, primary teeth, or baby teeth, are also known as deciduous teeth. Um, deciduous is actually a word that is not just for dental. It's a deciduous tree is a tree that leaves fall off every year, um, as opposed to a, a coniferous tree, which is a, like a pine tree or a tree that doesn't lose its its leaves. Uh, no, no tree with leaves actually is coniferous. O only pine trees, like you know. Um, trees with pine needles anyway deciduous teeth fall out and then they're replaced right that's what deciduous means uh, it's composed of 10 maxillary teeth and 10 mandibular teeth and they eventually all fall out and are replaced by permanent teeth they play a very in integral role in the formation of the mandible and the maxilla because we cannot support all of our permanent teeth um before we age right um before we grow and so it's important that we have teeth that function fully um as children and then as we grow and we have more room then we replace those teeth with um you know stronger more long lasting teeth um, an imaging examination of a child with primary dentition is a common occurrence in dental practices and what that means is we take x-rays on kiddos that's what that means <laughs> your book is so funny because it gives you such a proper version but I, I really need you to just like have those sentences where they say things like that and then just like what the heck does that mean it means we take we take x-rays on kiddos that's what we do um, so this is figures 27 73 in your book um, and you can see a lot of images of uh, primary dentition so according to the universal numbering system primary dentition are numbered a through T um, and so this one right here is a and then B and C you guys try writing with a with a mouse that's D right and then we have I'm sorry this is D this one's E F G H I J and then we have K down here L and then M is the canine um, N O and P are always the lower two central incisors uh, then we have Q and R is the other canine this one's R and then uh, S and T those look terrible but these are the numbering systems we have for primary dentition uh, so this one is C and this one is B um, you're gonna have a moment probably in uh, in private practice where you've completely forgotten what the what the numbers of each of these teeth are um, not numbers I'm sorry letters and um, I do a thing when I write notes where I actually put the number sign and then I put the letter and though it feels very wrong every time I do it like I'm like the patient is uh, has a retained number T um, it just gives me 
that this is not a letter. This is a this is the a tooth that I'm referring to. I'm not just referring to a letter in my notes. Okay, so um, make sure you as you're learning the teeth, you know how you learn like um, maybe all four of the maxillary molars are you know three, fourteen, nineteen, thirty. You're also going to do the same thing with primary dentition. So um, just just keep that in mind. So we see mixed dentition between the ages of 6 and 12 as the kiddos uh, begin to lose primary teeth and are replaced by permanent teeth. And usually around 12 or 13 is when that last baby tooth falls out and it is replaced and the patient 13 or so is when uh, all of the primary teeth are seen. Um, and so anywhere from 6 to 12 or 13, depending on the kiddo, you're looking at a mixed dentition where, you know, some of the teeth are primary and some of them are permanent. Um, you'll get really good to it trying to figure out which is which um, because sometimes they look the same, but, but um, there's definite markers for telling you which ones. And obviously with radiographs, that's the best way to know, right? Because it's going to look very different on a radiograph. Um, they can produce a variety of dental concerns. Um, whenever you see a kiddo anywhere from the ages of 6 to 12, you need to ask them, do they have any teeth that are loose, right? Because they'll tell you. They have a, a lot of fun telling you that they have wiggly teeth, and they'll show you which ones wiggle. Um, you see these on periapical, bite wing, and occlusal imaging techniques that we can use in order to examine those primary and mixed dentitions. We made it. So an hour, almost almost an hour and a half later. Um, this took me easily two days to record. So um, my feeling of relief is, is probably similar to yours. Um, if you have questions, please, please email me, put them in the discussion boards, uh, whatever you have to do. If you have questions about the things that we talked about in this chapter, it's a very important chapter. I would love to talk to you about them. Um, I would love to maybe go through, if you're having trouble coming up with mnemonic, uh, uh, you know, helpful ways to remember, I would love to help you go through these. So um, please, by all means, make sure you reach out to me.